Welcome to Street Knowledge with Chris Graham. Welcome to the show. I'm Chris Graham. It's Tuesday. We talk a lot of things on Tuesday with Scott German. We're going to talk a lot of baseball today uh, as MLB is pretty much the only sport right now playing uh, as we're waiting for NFL to uh, for the players to get to camp. We're waiting for colleges to get their players to football camp. The NBA just had a draft and that's just picking names that I've had. So Scott in the baseball world, maybe we should start here. What's up with your Orioles? Orioles are seven and three in their last 10. They're only five under 500. I've got them six and a half back of the wild card. Uh, the rebuild is still a rebuild, but they're getting close there, Scott. Yeah, they are. They're playing well. And I, I think I texted you. It's, it's actually fun again to watch them because you watch them now with the expect, reasonable expectation that they can win. Um, where that wasn't such a, that wasn't so the case in the last few years. You you watched with the expectation that they're going to lose. They may surprise you every once a week or twice a week with a win, but but no, they're playing really good ball and uh, starting to get some very good productivity from some of the acquisitions that they brought up or brought over really from um, the old the old I like to call the the scrap pile, which was a lot of people called the rule five players, but it shows that they're making some really good uh, acquisitions there. They just uh, got picked up a player that the Red Sox released uh, designated for assignment. Um, not sure how to pronounce his name. I two years or, or two way a two the a two years, I believe is the way you pronounce it. Great glove. He's been playing third base for the last three or four games and has really flashed a, uh, a good glove over at third. Um, Matteo, uh, Matios at short is just playing out of his mind. Once we trashed him last week for being a terrible hitter, he's become Rod Carew. He hit a home run last night to dead center field in the, at uh, the Mariners' Safeco Field. It was probably 406 feet uh, or so. Um, he's really becoming aggressive at the plate. It's got a great glove. Bullpen is one of the best in the majors. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're giving Oriole fans, which I am at the head of the pack on that, uh, a lot to be encouraged about. And then up down the uh, beltway in Washington, the Nats are still in last place in the NL East, and they will be for the rest of the season most likely, but seeing improvement with the Nationals. Um, uh, some better pitching of late anyway. Uh, took two or three in uh, Texas over the weekend, could have easily swept that series. Uh, split with the O's, uh, you know, competitive with the uh, Phillies last week. And um, uh, Michael Franco, a two run homer last night in the bottom of the eight, or yeah, bottom of the eighth inning to give the Nats the win. Former, former Orioles player, among other teams he's played with. And better pitching for the Nats lately. Uh, that's, that's been a key there, except for Patrick Corbin. That's just a given that Patrick Corbin's not going to be better. But I mentioned um, the Phillies, Scott, and some big news for for um, former Nats star Bryce Harper. He may be out for the season. The guy hit by a pitch on the thumb. Blake Snell hit him with a 98 mile per hour fastball. Uh, Harper had been hit in the face with a a pitch, I believe it was last year, and he said instinctively. He said after the game that he instinctively kind of put his hands up there to protect his face, and now he wishes he had just let the fastball hit him in the face because he recovered from the face injury. This thumb, this thumb might set him out for the rest of the season. Yeah, and I just got an update on Yahoo Sports two hours ago. It says that uh, Philly slugger Bryce Harper will require surgery to stabilize his broken left thumb. According to multiple sources, the surgery is not expected to be season ending, maybe six weeks, which, you know, Phillies are, are in the thick of a playoff, not necessarily a, uh, the division title, but thick in one of the wild card bursts. Uh, so, that's a that's a that could be a critical injury to uh, to Philadelphia. Yeah, that really could. He was hitting 315, 315 15 homers, OPS of uh, 985. Uh, he was the MVP last year, and he was putting up even better numbers this year. And the Phillies had been playing well after firing Joe Girardi. Uh, they're back in the thick of the playoff race at this early stage right now, and that's a that's a huge loss. I'm seeing some other news here too. I'm just. Boy, I'm scanning the wire, Scott, and the, the, the wire's full of news. Yeah, we, we, we're doing this at a good time. We're hitting a lot of – hitting a lot of – we're coming on at a good time, getting a lot of news flashes. Kenley Jansen, uh, the former Dodgers closer, 
Uh, now with the Atlanta Braves, uh, he's on the injured list. And, and this is, I don't like seeing this news, um, with, with uh, a regular heartbeat. And apparently from reading here, and of course, <laughs> season, uh, Kenley Jansen's uh, numbers this season, uh, the, let me, I'm, I'm pulling up real quick. He uh, is 4-0 as a reliever. That you know, it really doesn't really matter as much, but he's, he does have – I'm trying to see the saves. He has 20 saves with Atlanta. Uh, his ERA, 3.58. Uh, he's, he's doing the job there for Atlanta closing games out, but he apparently had an irregular heartbeat issue back in 2018 um, that landed him in a hospital, uh, and he initially underwent what's called a cardiac ablation in 2012 when a normal tissue in the left atrium of his heart was cauterized. Uh, and so this is an issue for, for Kenley James. And boy, that's kind of, that's, I was going to say kind of scary. It's very scary. Anytime you're talking about the heart, that's a, that's a pretty scary thing. He's on the 15 day injured list, but, uh, I certainly hope he gets back and, and in good health. Scott, you're muted. From what I'm, excuse me, from what I'm understanding, it's something that Jansen's been able, it's had for a while, has been able to manage it. So it is a little concerning when it, something like that uh, stops becoming manageable. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with the heart, that's that's no no other vital, more important organ than that. So, yeah, that's, uh, I wonder if that's going to require going to the disabled list or not. Oh yeah, injured list. He's on the 15 day injured list already, and you just hope that for his sake, he, um, you know, again, given his history, that he can he can recover. Hey, I wanted to get into. Uh, did, uh, were you watching or did you see highlights, Scott, of the the Mariners Angels brawl from this past weekend? I did. I watched it. Um, watched highlights of it. Uh, boy, that was the Donnie Brook, wasn't it? Well, it's it's it was so bad that twelve people have gotten bans. <laughs> they've gotten they've gotten suspensions, uh, including an interpreter, and, and also Anthony Rendon, who's on the injured list and he's out for the season with a broken right wrist. But he was in there punching with his left hand. I mean, this was a fight. Um, uh, the new uh, Angels interim manager is out for ten games. Phil Nevin is out for ten games. Uh, um, you know, among the people, um, this was a heck of a fight. Yeah, it was. It wasn't one of your typical Major League Baseball brawls in which there's a lot of standing around pushing. This was punches thrown. My wife watched it with the highlights with me. And at one point I heard her uh, scream, oh, my gosh, there's an old man on the ground. (laughs) It was one of the coaches for the Mariners. It reminded me of uh, the Zimmer uh, uh, Zimmer getting pushed down by the Red Sox uh, what was his name? The starter for the Marti- uh, Martinez, Mar- Pedro, Pedro Martinez, Pedro yeah. Martinez. And, and basically Pedro pushed him and said, get away from me, old man. And, um, you know, the, I, I told my wife, Stephanie, I said, look, when those things happen, <laughs> those, those older guys, they, they kind of, you know, they don't pay any attention to their age. Their adrenaline just takes over. What happened there was on Saturday night, um, uh, Mike Trout had a fastball buzz over his head. Uh, Trout's been hitting really well lately. And, you know, when it, it's, it's kind of odd, you know, major league pitchers are, are usually, let's just say they're, they don't, they don't have the control issues that would have them buzzing 95 mile an hour fastballs over the star hitters head of the other team. Um, I think baseball laws control of this when they, they didn't start the game with, Hey, okay. We understand that there was something yesterday um, we're, we're going to start this game with both teams already on warning. Uh, and, and, and the angels pitcher threw a, at a couple of guys and, um, uh, the number two and four hitters in the lineup for some reason, in, in the first inning, <laughs> he, he didn't throw at the one and three hitters in the first inning. He threw at the two and four hitters. Um, uh, and, uh, and that's when, that's when things get out of control. I mean, if, if, because if you're the angels and your guy gets a fastball buzzing over his head and your your guy in the form of Mike Trout, your guy, the league's guy. You've got to protect him, and and so that was that was going to happen, um, and and they made base. I think the umpire just lost control from the from the get go with this one. Yeah, I blame that on the umpires. Um, they they should have had a little better handle on that. You knew what was going to happen, and they still it, it still happened. Um, and and you know as much as I hate to say it's kind of fun watching it. There's no real, I mean, that's not exactly 
what you want Major League Baseball. I mean, you've seen brawls in the NBA. You would think that the Major League Baseball, the player respect between teams, you, you just can't throw it at a, at a player's head. I know the guys have got – the pitchers have got great control and they could hit a fly, you know, on a wall from 60 feet very easily. But still, you know, you, you can't throw it at a, at a player's head, whether it's Mike Trout or Mike Smith, whoever that might be. You know, the reason Nevin gets the long suspension, uh, I didn't realize this until I'm reading this, the story on this. Um, he originally had his scheduled starter was Jose Suarez, a starter for his team. He sent out um, uh, Jesse Winker yeah. uh, to be his his opener. His hit um, man. His, his, basically his hit man. He, he sent Winkler out. It may as well have been Henry Winkler. <laughs> he sent out He sent out his made man. I mean, yeah, he, hey, I'm, I'm my schedule starter. I'm not going to get him thrown out of the game. He's, I don't want him throwing just, you know, part of an inning. So I'm going to send out this guy. And his job is to hit, is to hit a guy. He got, ten, that's why Nevin got 10 games. Yeah, he literally put in a, a a pitcher that was it there for one purpose and one purpose only to to, to hit to hit uh, was it the first batter he faced? Well, he hit the his second and fourth batters he faced. Um, uh, and he did get seven. I think he got seven games. He, uh, well, I'm sorry, it was once. Uh, Andrew Wants is the starting pitcher. Winker is one of the guys who got hit. Um, yeah, it was it was uh, Andrew wants the, the the opener though. I mean, you know, we can call him the opener. He was just he was the assassin. Um, <laughs> and now, to be fair, he hit he hit the one guy like in the butt. I mean, so it's not like he threw at the guy's head when he was tr- throwing at him, but still he threw at him, and that's dangerous. It hurts. Um, and I, I, this is just I'll just say this from uh, comes to mind for me every every spring, Scott. When I do, I, I broadcast between fifteen and twenty games a year on ESPN for uh, college baseball. Um, guys in college baseball get hit with pitches and they're getting hit with, I mean, you're, you're talking 85, 90 mile an hour fastballs. I'm not, you know, there, that, there's a difference between that and 90 to 95, but not much college guys get hit. They go to first base. MLB's guys get hit and they raise, they raise this kind of ruckus. Um, I wonder what happens between college and MLB where they, they lose their manhood and they have to go crazy over getting hit by the pitches. Um, I don't know. What do you think? I think it's histrionics is what I'm guessing, because if, if, if those college guys can wear it and they, and that's what we say, it's what you say in baseball, just wear it, run down to first. Don't act like it hurt. Don't rub, don't rub it. Um, and then in, in, in the majors, they're throwing that one guy through the, the big box of sunflower seeds. That's what took a lot of the time to get the game started back. Cause he, they had to pick up all the sunflower seeds. Yeah. Um, you know, if that's just, that's just putting on a show. I mean, now, yes, the throwing at Trout's head the night before, I mean, that's dangerous. Um, but the next day, to me, if you're the Mariners, you know, okay, take it. You, you, your guy threw it there, best player, the, the league, Major League Baseball's best player. Your, your guy's supposed to wear one, and when he wears one, now we're even. Uh, and, and when you guys throw a fit over it, that's when we're not even. That's when it gets to a fight stage. Yeah, and which makes you wonder because they'll they're in the same division. They they play each other nineteen times. Yeah. Um, what's going to happen when they go to Seattle? Yeah, yeah. Uh, hopefully, um, cooler. Ha- well, maybe start the first game with warnings to both benches and just say, "Hey, you know," I and mean, that's what the umpire should probably do. If anybody does anything crazy here, uh, you're out of the game. And we'll, we'll we've already suspended guys. I, what I like from, from Major League Baseball here is the intensity of these suspensions. Often MLB will just suspend a guy for a game or a couple games, and they'll appeal and they'll reduce it. And you know, the, the, these were some pretty string, stringent uh, suspensions. I mean, Phil Nevin getting ten games, Anthony Rendon he's out for the season. I mentioned that, but he can't sit on the bench for seven games. And then when he comes back next year, presumably from his wrist injury. He's got to set out the first five games. So, I mean, messages were sent here by MLB, which is we're not going to accept this this fighting on the field. Yeah, and yeah, ten multiple games, that many games. That's that's a lot of that's a lot of games. You know, you see players getting suspended three, five games sometimes, but uh, um, you know, that's a. I'm looking. I, I did pull that up. 
some interesting cast of characters that are on the dis- the, the, the suspension list. Uh-huh. How does the interpreter get involved in that? <laughs> he, the interpreter goes out, but then Shohei Otani, to his credit, um, his involvement in the fight was to, he was just trying to get in between guys and, and break it up. So Shohei Otani class guy. Yeah. The interpreter got two games, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, in the quietly in the clubhouse, the guys love that. Um, I know that we're not supposed to like fights and all that kind of stuff, but the guys in the clubhouse are like Manny Del Campo, man, you're one of us. Now you were out there, you were out there bailing on, on the Mariners. Um, you know, that, <laughs> kudos man we'll pay your suspension i mean we'll pay your fine or whatever we'll pay we'll, we'll make we'll make up your salary loss for those two games uh but yeah that you know a guy a guy with a cast on his right hand who's out for the season in, in anthony rendon the interpreter or you know, a, a, a guys who are getting suspensions here um this is this, this, this could is a, be the old man and I'm, I'm i don't have it up here but it could have been the the person that my wife was screaming at that they were going to kill <laughs> Dom Chidi? No, no. Manny Del Campo was the is the interpreter. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the the old man that oh. was on the ground. He got who could be. I'm not, not sure how old Dom Chidi is, but I think he's been around for a while. He's the Angels' assistant pitching coach. Oh well, if, one and, not everybody has an assistant pitching coach, but yeah, that sounds like a guy who <clears throat> who might have gotten thrown around there. So that hey, that's I mean. You know, we don't, we don't, hockey, hockey doesn't lend itself uh, to a lot of similarities with baseball. You know, they don't play with, with money ball kind of statistics and that kind of thing, but Hey, this was a hockey fight. Uh, and this was, a, this was a good fight for a hot, this would have been a good hockey fight for a hockey fight too. Um, as far as that goes. Yeah. And it kind of reminded you of a hockey fight. You know, they were up against the, the, it happened so close to the, to the railing. Yeah. That the I watched the YouTube video of it and it was you have to there's multiple youtube videos shot from fans and one fan had a great commentary describing it as if he was describing a uh wwe wrestling match (laughs) (laughs) not a lot of most baseball fights are not really fights they're just the bench is empty some guys run in from the bullpen they all stand around. We call them, you know, I'm a pro wrestling fan. We call them pull aparts, you know, because in pro wrestling, you know, to help advance, you know, the, how these two guys really hate each other, you'll send them out there, they'll grab each other, and then you send a bunch of referees out and security people dress up as security and you pull them apart and they never actually throw a punch at each other and it just looks good. Well, that's, almost every baseball fight's a pull apart. Um, this was a fight. Uh, so, uh, you know, credit to them for that, but tisk tisk MLB says no more. We we're gonna we're gonna throw the book at you, and I guess from baseball's perspective, you know, hey, it was a Sunday game. It's it's two teams under five hundred. Um, it got it, we're talking about the Mariners and Angels. We wouldn't we talk about them otherwise? We're talking about MLB in that respect. So, you know, I always say this, uh, Scott. Whenever I have Rod Mullins on for our, our weekly NASCAR podcast. I, 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 he often catches me pining for the days when guys who wrecked each other on, on the track get out of their cars and throw punches at each other. And NASCAR doesn't allow that to happen anymore. I miss those days. So in that context, this was, this was good. Um, yeah. When I see my wife tonight, I want to have to have a strong conversation with her because the old man that she said was laying on the ground, Dom Chidi is a year younger than me. Uh oh, <laughs> he was born. He was born in 1958. So, I don't think you should mention that to your wife. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. But maybe you don't bring that up. I that don't consider I, than me, it, Stephanie. <laughs> but when I did see him on the ground, I thought the same thing. That poor old man. He just, <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Okay. Well, <laughs> uh, AARP memberships notwithstanding. Hey, so let, uh, if we can real quick, somewhere okay. on baseball, go back a little to the Orioles. But one thing I, I made a note I wanted to ask you about, I don't know how much war, baseball, Oriole baseball you watch, but one thing that I'm finding very interesting, and I had it pointed out to me on an Oriole chat uh, page, Promptly, I mean, appropriately enti- uh, titled Peter Angelos Must Go. <laughs> and it has 
4,286 members. Oh, which, that's all. I'm surprised. Yeah, of which I recently earned gold badge status. I don't know <laughs> if that's a good thing. No, that's that's very much a good thing. Yeah. Okay. So um, if you're watching the games very closely, you'll notice a couple things. One, um, with with the uh, Adley Ratsman, who is really starting to live up to his potential. Um, if you notice at his at-bats, um, he's not stepping out and doing the complete uh, batting gloves. Uh -huh. He steps out. He keeps one foot in the batter's box. He steps back on his other foot, and he is back in the batter's box ready to go. And I can't help but to believe this is a result of the uh, pitch count in the minor leagues that he's that he's been used to now. What do you think? Oh, you've been talking about that, yeah. Uh, that uh, the there's young no guys, there's no fooling with his batting gloves, you know, pulling his jock strap up. I mean, he literally takes a step back on his right foot, keeps his left foot in the box, regrips the bat, and he's back in the box, always waiting on the next pitch. I think we talked about well, maybe it was our last podcast. We talked about how minor league baseball, the rules that have been enforced in minor league baseball the last several years now, as far as pitch the pitch clock, which also then goes against the batter. Um, yeah, it's 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 going to have an impact. I'm looking at his numbers in the last uh, last week. He's eight for twenty three, so that's a that's a better than three thirty three average. Two homers, five RBIs. Um, so yeah, definitely his his season numbers are improving, and. Um, no, it, 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 I think I think you're noticing something there that you would have expected to notice. And here's the only thing we can hope: we can, we only can hope that that the minor league guys who have come up through the system, used to the 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 increased pace of play, which are more and more now, don't lose it when they get around other guys. So, um, in fact, we hope that they um, kind of wear off on on the other guys, the older right. guys who never right. haven't played with that kind of a, a pace. So. No, we can only hope more of this and, le and, and not less uh, as far as that goes. Well, if you go to enough minor league games, you'll notice the games are much uh, – are played much at a much faster pace, and it's it really is more enjoyable. And, my, and I love baseball. I, I, I am not – I don't have a problem with sitting through a three-hour-and-a-half game if it's entertaining, but a three-hour-and-a-half game that ends nine to four – not not so much but it's never um, close yeah and we see plenty of those yeah you know you see a lot of those and and those at the end of the game there's you're lucky to have half the the, the, the crowd is lucky to be 50 percent of what it started so um not so much with the the trip the minor leagues because those games i told you at richmond on friday nights they have fireworks and they're not supposed to start until like not till dark of course yeah, which yeah. now is around 9 15 9 20 9 30 the game started 6 30 and it's nothing unusual for the fans to have to wait around an hour for yeah. fireworks to start which again the pace of play in the minor leagues is much um swifter than what it is in the in the majors right now well, th that extra hour of waiting around is also an extra hour of sobering up. Maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, because they do have a strict last call for alcohol at the at the end of seven. So yeah, at the end of seven. So if you're you know you're waiting two innings and then you wait an hour, um, the effects of all those uh, those cheap beers have gone away. <laughs> that's maybe not a bad thing. Um, and, and so hey, you're talking minor league baseball. I'll, I'll skip to a topic that involves minor league baseball. Also involves the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, questioning the legality of Major League Baseball's antitrust exemption. And for those out there, uh, I, I won't bore you with my constitutional law background, just enough to say antitrust exemption essentially gives Major League Baseball the, a monopoly over professional baseball uh, in the United States. They, they don't have to uh, submit to certain, um, certain federal laws that, that prevent uh, competition in their business. Um, and uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee is looking at this with relationship to um, the impact on salaries for minor league baseball players. And uh, a bipartisan effort led by Senators Dick Durbin, Chuck Grassley, Richard Blumenthal, and Mike Lee. So you got two Democrats, two Republicans there um, asking, uh, and I'm, I'll quote here, we write to seek information about how baseball's antitrust exemption is impacting competition in the labor market for minor league ball players." 
as well as the operation of minor league teams. Scott, this comes in the wake of a couple of years ago, Major League Baseball during the pandemic uh, completed the purchase of, of uh, MILB, minor, minor league baseball, and then contracted about 25% of the teams. And of course, uh, salaries, uh, per diems, et cetera, for minor league ball players, notoriously low. Um, and uh, so, you know, boy, the, uh, the end of the antitrust exemption, if it were to come, and these, these seem to be important first steps in that direction, could really have an impact on what MLB does in regard to the business operations of MILB. In which we now know that MLB owns the MILB. That's right. That's right. Um, but as we talked about before we went on the air, forever, Major League Baseball has considered itself a sport, not a business. So you wonder how much longer that that ideology is going to continue to fly. Yeah. Because believe me, it's very much a business. Um, I was reading too on this. Um, it'll what right now the right now Major League Baseball will not allow uh, teams to. Uh, a franchise to move to another city without permission from um, Major League Baseball. I wonder if that's got anything to do with um, the big push for this. Well, uh, one thing I'm reading here, uh, and this this will make sense when you when you hear the whole thing. At first, it might sound like legal gobbledygook. The uniform player contract signed by every minor leaguer, so basically anybody drafted, anybody signing an undrafted free agent contract states that teams control the rights of players for up to seven years in the minor leagues and then seven more years in the major leagues. Due to the antitrust exemption, if a minor leaguer decides to stop playing the sport before the seven years in the minors or majors are up, that team owns the rights of the player and he cannot play the sport professionally anywhere unless he's released from that contract. So essentially, um, that's, that's what at least these questions from the Senate Judiciary Committee are attacking is the the contract that every player signs. I mean, that's, that's, that's fundamentally going to change baseball. I don't, I don't, I'd wonder Scott without, without knowing, and maybe I should get a legal expert in here, a sports law expert in, in here at some point to help answer this. But we talk a lot about the collective bargaining agreement and how major league baseball, of course, they just, uh, have, are, they're still actually working their way through, uh, that process right now. They just agreed to start the season, but you know, the, a big sticking point for the MLBPA, the players association has been that control of, right. of players' few, you know, their, their contract status. Um, have to wonder what the end of the antitrust exemption, if it were to come, would impact as far as that goes. That would be, that would seem to you seem to think that could give players a lot of leeway uh, in getting control back of their contractual rights. And and, and Chris, uh, going from that. Think of the effect it'll have on a lot of major league teams that aren't named or that aren't that aren't housed in New York City, Chicago, Boston, L.A. Um, mid market teams like the Orioles that have changed their entire philosophy around and uh, about drafting, getting players, keeping them for six years under team control, and then you know if they want to walk, let them walk. Um, or trade them before for other prospects. I mean, that's the way a lot of teams are approaching how they how they are competing nowadays. Certainly, the Orioles being one franchise. My goodness, that could just be devastating for some of these teams if if the six year or seven year player control uh, is done away with. What I'm reading here, uh, as in, in an article about this. Um, one of the one of the major things here is, is freedom of movement. Essentially, Scott, you were talking about this. When you're required to sign a contract as a minor leaguer, because no one goes straight to the major league. So when you're required as a minor leaguer to sign that contract that gives that team that long of control over your future, um, you can't make a decision year to year to hey, I'm, you know, for example, this article points out in 2022, minor leaguers are paid an annual salary between forty eight hundred dollars a year and fifteen thousand four hundred dollars a year. Poverty, the, the federal poverty guideline for one person is 13590 They're making poverty wages or less uh, to, to you know, advance their careers. Some of the guys get bonuses. A lot of the guys don't. Um, a lot of them don't. A lot of them don't. So you, by signing, by being forced to sign that long-term contract, 
you can't say, hey, I'm in single A with uh, the Baltimore Orioles organization. I, I think I can get a better deal with the Nats. Maybe I'll see if I can go after this season's over. I'll see if I can get a better deal with the Nats. You can't do that. You've signed a seven-year deal. Um, and so uh, that's that's at least one one aspect of many that would seem to be uh, at question here. This the, the exemption dates back to 1922, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, handed down a ruling uh, saying that MLB could suppress wages and make business decisions operating outside of anti-monopoly rules. So um, that may have been good for business in 1922. It's certainly not good here in 2022 for the players anyway, and for the franchises. Uh, you know, Scott, you you go a lot. You you visit a lot. Uh, our friends with the Richmond Flying Squirrels. You you've been recently to the Norfolk Tides. Uh, it would impact them too, and, and maybe in a positive way. Yeah, but you know, there, the flip side of it is there. There is some security in these players getting. Well, maybe not. Maybe not at the minor league level because if they come in and they play a year and they, the club realizes that oh, these are not professional ball players, I guess they can cut them because there's no guaranteed contracts at the minor league level. I would imagine. I may be wrong. On they that. have control over you, but they. That, that, but they can also fine. cut you. They can cut you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's a two way street, but. Um, you know, if I'm if hasn't Major League Baseball always been regulated by the government? No, this this antitrust exemption since the 1920s uh, has basically let baseball up. Baseball is the only professional sport in the U.S. that operates under an antitrust exemption. So, um, you know, that think about it. So why why is there an NFL, a USFL? There have been all these attempts at other professional football leagues. Remember, the NFL lost – now, they didn't lose much money, but they lost a federal antitrust case in the 1980s by the original USFL, uh, where the USFL uh, alleged – and, it, you know, the jury found on their side that uh, the NFL was engaging in mon monopolistic practices, basically by doing things like uh, signing leases with uh, – non-competitive leases with uh, – uh, stadiums uh, that would effectively bar the USFL from from being able to compete at the same time of year. That was when the USFL was trying to play in the fall, um, you know, locking down stadiums. Uh, uh, Major League Baseball uh, doesn't have. There's there have been the, the NBA had the ABA as competitor for for a long for what ten or twelve years there. Um, I'm not sure hockey really has any competitors, but that's mainly because you know would there be good business competitors there? But there's no nothing prohibiting that. Um, yeah, Major League Baseball, by virtue of it being Major League Baseball with this exemption handed down by the Supreme Court 100 years ago, can't have competition. It's It's got federally protected anti-competition um, uh, written into the law, basically. Which is, is <clears throat> to me, an extremely valuable benefit because – To Major League Baseball, to, it is, yeah. For baseball, just off, just off the hand, I think that – Okay, Major League Baseball can dictate what the salaries for minor league players are. And, well, and honestly, they can dictate. That's that's how I think that they can get away with the the, the players. The players really have no hand. Uh, the major league players, that is, MLBPA, has no has nothing to really leverage because uh, they the uh, MLBPA can't really go to anything other than an arbitrator. Uh, to, to get record uh, to re redress grievances if Major League Baseball says uh, we're just gonna lock you out. I mean, there's there's that's that 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 uh, helps in that res MLB's business model in that respect too. Um, uh, you can't get the National Labor Relations Board involved. You know, you can't. Uh, you, you know, the, the, it, there's certainly limitations for player movement, their player ability to make their full value. We're stat geeks, Scott. We, I, I know I look all the time at, in, in addition to exit velocity and spin rate and everything like that, um, some of the great sites that, that are out there, uh, fan graph, sport track, will, th will show you a player's value to his team versus, and, and then compare that to what that player's being paid. I saw the number for Juan Soto because this year his, his value to his team is a lot less. He's not performing quite up to standard. But the last couple of years, he was getting paid. Now, he's a guy under six-year control still. Um, he's getting paid in the five to $10 million range. And he was worth, uh, to the Nats. Uh, I think it was last year it was $59 million. He was worth to them, but he's getting paid, you know, five to $8 million. I think last year, somewhere in that range, um, you know, on the open market, you're not necessarily gonna get paid $59 million if you're worth $59 million, but you're going to get a lot closer to $59 million. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I, I, and it's because baseball 
operates under a set of rules that no, literally no other sport business, sport business operation, or really not many other businesses can operate under. Yeah, this is uh, this is going to be interesting to follow. This this could end up um, this could end up into at the, at the Supreme Court level, and you know they haven't had a lot going on lately, so maybe they need to have something to do. You know. <laughs> well, I think I mean what we're seeing here. This is a well, the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, and it's a bipartisan group, and I think that's pretty important to point out because you know a lot of what happens in D.C. these days is Democrats initiating it or Republicans initiating it. The other side automatically hates what they're doing, and you know, and then nothing happens. Um, the, the senators I mentioned here, and I'll go back to, to, to just reiterate this. And these are, these are uh, well-known folks, Dick Durbin, a Democrat, Richard Blumenthal, a Democrat, and then Chuck Grassley, Republican, Mike Lee, Republican. We're not talking about backbenchers uh, right. in the Senate. We're talking about, you know, guys who... Um, heavy hitters. Heavy hitters are movers and shakers. When they want things done, things get done. Um, these aren't freshmen, sophomore people that are just looking for something to hitch their wagon to. Exactly. Exactly. So, and, and when you get people from both sides with, with that name cachet saying, we're going to investigate this and we're thinking about legislation that may take away your antitrust exemption, that speaks volumes. Um, it's not going to happen tomorrow necessarily, but this feels like the first step in an effort that may result in a year or two with uh, some substantive action. So, um, it'll be interesting to see now what MLB does in response. I mean, what you often see when businesses uh, or an industry, in this case, like MLB, seems to have its its model threatened, um, they they all of a sudden start coming out with magnanimous offers to, uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to raise salaries for all major league or minor league baseball players. Right, hey, they throw them a carrot. They throw a couple carrots out there because they don't want to lose everything. Well, and they've essentially done that with when they, when they, MLB, Major League Baseball bought minor league baseball, MILB, by issuing mandates to some of these minor league teams, uh, like the Richmond Flying Squirrels, that they have to have their facilities up to par. They have to have certain, um, upgrades by a certain date so you would think that the, that this could be avoided by maybe just like i said throw them in a care opening up uh increasing player salaries at the at the lower minor league levels because you, you're right those a lot of those players aren't they're making poverty level wages and they didn't they didn't sign bonus baby money you know yeah. checks so uh, it's something I've heard stories about them going on the road and, and going to buffet restaurants and sticking mashed potatoes in their pockets yeah, so they could have something to eat on the bus. I mean, it's real. It's, it's, it's a real tough life. And that's why so many players wash out early on in the, in, in their professional career. And I'm thinking just from a standpoint of these are my future potential future employees. I mean, you know, uh, we know that not everybody in minor league baseball is going to make it to the big leagues, but we're training those guys. And there are diamonds in the rough who make it. Mike Piazza, back when the draft was 60 rounds, like a, he was a, a 60th round pick. He's a Hall of Famer now. That's, you know, that's that's an exception more than a rule, but still he made his way there. And guys like that don't necessarily become Hall of Famers, but they, they make the big leagues all the time. And so if I'm if I'm looking at minor league baseball as my training grounds for my future employees, you think I would want to pay them decently and feed them better. I mean, instead of having guys going to buffets, going to McDonald's just because it's cheaper, I would want my guys eating well. Colleges treat colleges treat their student athletes better than that. Colleges have, you know, training tables. Colleges have great training staffs. They get, they have access to all these great facilities to work out in. And in a professional sports franchise in in franchises in MLB don't and that blows my mind that they're, that they're, you know, the, the crop of, you know, the guys in 10 years that we'll be rooting for and talking about and everything <laughs> else uh, are going through this, this process. It, it, is it supposed to make them tougher that they have to ride rickety buses and eat, you know, eat what they can afford to eat and not have, have any kind of good living conditions, not the access to, to training facilities that can make them better. Is that are we supposed to think that toughens them up and makes them better ball players? I would think I would want to lavish my guys and make sure that they have the best they can have to get them ready to be uh, potential MLB stars in the future. Oh, that's that would be my 
uh, the way I would operate, but I wonder if, if some of these major league teams just think, okay, well, we'll apply analytics to this. And most of these single A players aren't going to whiff the major leagues. So we're not going to really invest a lot in them those first year or two until they start, you know, elevating up the ladder in the system. Well, if, and if that's the case, then why do you have those levels of play? Uh, you know, maybe just uh, winnow down the the number of teams. you And, that, you know, that's maybe what they're doing. But, um, you know, winnow down the number of teams you have and just focus on the guys that you, you're going to miss out on some guys. We know that. There's, you there's, will miss out. But th- 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 there will be leagues that they can go to that they aren't part of Major League Baseball that if they're uh, someone that got missed out on, they could still be – discovered i guess and i think what we're fine i think what we're stumbling upon here scott is if major major league baseball kind of is using what college teams used to use back in the day when you, when texas or nebraska could have 200 guys on scholarship and in, in football and have literally everybody in the state of texas everybody in the state of nebraska on scholarship <laughs> they didn't really care if those guys ever played for nebraska or texas they just didn't want them to play in somewhere else right they would rather than sit on the sidelines with a, you know, never a chance to play than to go to Texas A&M or, or Baylor or some other smaller school. So in, in the case of major league baseball, perhaps uh, giving, if, if you think about it, there's, I, I haven't seen the number, but you got to think there's roughly what five or six major league, minor league teams per, per franchise. That's what 125 times 30 would be three or 4,000 minor league players. And maybe I'm underestimating that. Um, well, I think there's 120, Teams, 120 teams times 25, that'd be 3,000. Right. Um, so if there's 3,000 minor league baseball players and you really only think about 200 of them are going to be potential major leaguers, uh, out, out of that, out of this current group of 3,000, those other 2,800 guys go play somewhere else. Um, that's you know, right now, minor league, uh, major league baseball through minor league baseball. Um, at least gets to make the money by owning minor league baseball. When it, when we go to a Fred Nats game, we go to a Squirrels game. Uh, if we pay for parking, we pay for tickets, we pay for hot dogs. Major league baseball gets a, a share of that money instead of some other league getting a share of that money. Um, and they're not paying those guys anything. So whatever they whatever they're making, they're making. Um, that's uh, that's that's the monopoly that that's existing there. That preventing those guys from being able to play somewhere else effectively means they can't go play somewhere else and there can't be independent leagues that can maybe challenge major league baseball eventually. And that's, that's the heart of what we're talking about here. I think. Yeah, exactly. Major league baseball doesn't want a competitor. And, you know, talking about there's 3000 players, many of them will never play at the major league level. The famous Cal Ripken quote of why there were so many players in the minor leagues. Well, you got to have that many players to play catch with the players that do make it to the majors. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, you're right. Well, fascinating discussion here. Uh, good talking about baseball. Well, Scott, uh, thanks for uh, for joining here and, and, and offering. And for our listeners out there, thank you as well. If you have something for us to talk about on a future podcast, email me at AugustaFreePress2 at gmail.com. I'd love to have your comments, uh, any criticisms, any attaboys, anything like that. And we'd love to address your topics on a future show. Hey, Chris, can we throw a teaser out? Oh, sure. Teaser. Uh, next week. We'll share some information about Better Call Saul. Better Call Saul, yeah. Which will be less than a week from its return. In fact, yeah, we'll we'll probably dedicate a better part of our show next week to Better Call Saul. A lot of big news. Second half of season two uh, dropping on what? uh, The first first episode is July 11th. So July 11th, yeah. Yeah, counting down the days. Uh, Well, for Scott German, I'm Chris Graham signing off. Everyone have a great day.